So my name is Tad Hussey, and I have a business called uh, Keep It Simple, and we do we have a organic side uh, focused on online gardening products and soils, and then we have a farm side as well, which I'll talk about here in a section. In a second, but originally my talk was benefits of organic soil. I talked to Bob two months ago and changed it to a slightly different talk that I thought would be more applicable to you guys as 502 growers. Um, I do talk about organic soil in this talk, but this is really more about ways to source and save money while growing healthier plants so you're not sacrificing uh, yield or anything on the cultivation side without while still uh, saving money. So uh, what I'm here to talk about today is the fact that I think that there is a, a pretty fundamental flaw right now in the cannabis industry in regards to this widening gap that we have between agriculture and horticultural knowledge and uh, what's coming out of the hydroponic side and uh, these shops and stuff in terms of the nutrient lines that we're given. So what I want to talk about is how we can bridge that gap and realistically you don't have anyone putting out advanced nutrients or general hydroponics on you know your home gardener or your home garden or your farm crops because not only are these products prohibitively expensive but there's uh, better uh, cheaper options out there that still allow you to get good, good health and yield. So this all started about 10 years ago with two very simple premises. One was how do we grow the healthiest organic medicine possible. Uh, I'm a big organic guy. That's really important to me. I believe cannabis is medicine and we need to treat it as such. Uh, so I, I, I'm not here to talk about synthetic nutrients. I do have a little spiel on that I can give you after the talk if anyone's interested. But uh, we're here to focus on the organic side. So that was the first part of it. Uh, the second part of it was, how do we do this in the most affordable manner? Well, a lot of these products do get very expensive. You have to you're trying to create this perfect indoor environment for these plants. Uh, it costs a lot of money. So ways that we can save money allows, allows a grower to be more successful down the road in running a business. I don't know how washed out these photos are, but uh, this photo was from uh, First time grower on their first crop, grown in soil with biochar in it, with just three applications of compost tea. Yield was over two pounds per light, growing uh, green bean, Martian, harlequin, and uh, Dutch treat. They use CO2 and single ended HPS bulbs. Uh, here's another photo. I'll apologize right now for the photos. We're, we're growers, we're not photographers. I have a few great ones later on, but uh, I realize these are a little hard to see here. I might just skip that slide. Uh, this was an outdoor crop we grew at our test greenhouse. Uh, these were these were grown for under thirty dollars in nutrients and soil. And I like this photo, even though it's hard to see. Uh, the great thing about this photo, this grower was yielding 1.6 pounds per light under 1,000 watts single-ended bulbs without CO2, no inputs but water. But this soil is over three years old, so they've been recycling this soil now for three years. Uh, and doing it for under $30 a pound of dried, of dried bud or their final flower. So very, very affordable. So this is a little bit more about, uh, a little bit of background on where we're coming from. Um, I grew up on a uh, seven acre nursery and landscaping uh, business with my parents owning it. Uh, this was the property down here. And they sold the business about 10, about 15 years ago now. And my father uh, started a compost tea brewing company. This is back in around 2000. This is sort of the infancy of that industry. And he was working with Dr. Elaine Ingham in establishing a lot of the protocols, things like uh, brewing lengths and optimal temperatures and what micron size is best for mesh bags and whether or not E. coli could survive uh, for an entire brew cycle when added, added to compost teas. So that, that was my father's background, and then I came into that and started learning about all these all this microbiology from uh, from them. And uh, when we got this property back about five years ago now, we had this online compost tea brewing business. And rather than opening another nursery, because it was right in the middle of a lot of the economic depression that we were facing in the housing industry, so there wasn't a lot of business for the nursery. So we took it in a different direction, and I really wanted to focus on promoting local uh, local food and growing organic food uh, in your in your uh, in your home. So we're a seven acre farm and feed store now. Uh, we have an organic hydro shop that sells bulk soil amendments. We focus on um, 
any, anything relating to organics. We don't carry any synthetic chemicals. And we happen to have a couple pigs, uh, a flock of chickens, ducks, rabbits running around. Right now we have some turkeys. We're hoping to add a milking goat. And there's an outdoor preschool that comes in every week, and it's great to see the kids interacting with the animals. It's a, it's a really fun place. I'm pretty fortunate to have that uh, as a place to work. And that's totally unrelated to the cannabis side of, of our business, which is more focused on the soils and some of these soil amendments. And so that side of the business we kind of put as Kiss Organics. And so we have our soil line and online bulk amendments. So that's my background. I came from growing up uh, learning from the horticulture uh, industry and from my father about this sort of stuff from an entirely different perspective. It wasn't until about 15 years ago that I walked into my first hydro shop. I forgot about this slide. So this is my father. I know I don't look like a traditional gardener. I think my dad does. I, I do realize that uh, we don't look that much alike, but he is, he is my genetic father. Uh, his hands, he'd actually just wash them. They're literally that dirty all the time because he's always out playing in the dirt. He is a character around the farm. Uh, his latest project, now that he's retired, is he's looking to get technologies like biochar and compost teas into uh, poor villages in in uh, third world countries working in places like China and India uh, as ways to make these technologies available at a very affordable level. So right now he's experimenting with bio, biochar kilns and uh, having a lot of fun with that as his sort of retirement project. But this was my experience when I first walked into a hydro shop. Tons of bottled nutrients. I didn't see any plants, which was a shock to me because I'd, uh, I'd never been in a nursery without, or a, a grow center without plants. And uh, I had no idea what any of these things were. And frankly, it was a little overwhelming. You talk to uh, a grocery store employee or a guy online or anybody, and they're all saying, you need to use this nutrient line, or this nutrient line's the best. Or you want to combine this product from one nutrient line and this product from another nutrient line, you add at the third week using this soil. You know, like they have it dialed in. Really confusing. And so I took a step back and I started looking at what was actually on the ingredient label so we can compare these products as best as possible. And I, on the organic side, we see the same things. We see fish hydrolysate, humic acids, uh, blackstrap molasses, uh, mycorrhizal fungus, trichoderma. Uh, and I'm here to talk a little bit about those sorts of things and different sources for them so we can really compare products uh, without getting into all the marketing aspects of it. Because if you take a step back and think about it, we're taking an unknown media. You know, how many people have done soil tests on Fox Farm, Ocean Forest, or Happy Frog, or Roots Organics to really know what they're starting with in terms of macro and micronutrients? Then we're taking a fertilizer, or a nutrient line, which again, we don't know all the specs on in terms of trace minerals in a lot of cases. We're combining the two, and then we're saying that we're trying to grow optimal plants and for plant health, which doesn't really make sense to me. Um, because we're trying to play God and control the plant, which I'll explain here in just a second. So, how many people have heard of mycorrhizal fungus? Yeah, if I'd asked this question like 15 years ago, we probably got like one hand. So it's been become really popular in the industry, which is wonderful. It's a it's a it's a fungus that forms a symbiotic relationship with the with the roots of the plant. Uh, over 90% have a mycorrhi mycorrhizal relationship. There's three types, main types of mycorrhizal. There is endo, ecto, and ericoid. Now, ericoid mycorrhiza refers to azaleas, blueberries, rhododendrons. Uh, there's only one company that I'm aware of, Santiam Organics, that's making uh, commercially available uh, ericoid mycorrhizae. Then we have ecto mycorrhizae, which infects the outside of the roots and is specific to primarily conifers. Again, no relationship with cannabis. So there's no point in buying products that have these things in them and applying our cannabis expecting to get mycorrhizal infection. So what we want is endomycorrhiza, specifically Glomus interradices and Glomus mossiae. Those are the two most widely studied and researched. Uh, they're the ones that uh, all the universities use in trials. So those are the ones that we want to look for and compare when we're comparing mycorrhizal products. And two important things about mycorrhiza is uh, high phosphorus and trichoderma have been shown to inhibit mycorrhizal infection or mycorrhizal association. So it, it makes sense if you think about it. Uh, my, high, mycorrhizal fungus is one of the primary ways a plant gets phosphorus in a natural system. So if a plant's getting plenty of phosphorus already, it has no need to make that association. It's not putting out the right exudates 
to form that infection, so it inhibits it. But mycorrhizal fungus has a lot of benefits beyond just phosphorus uptake, so it's important that we cater that relationship early on in a plant's life by not applying high P. Trichoderma is a very aggressive and parasitic microbe, so it, they found when they add it at the same time as mycorrhiza, you also have that issue where it will parasitize the mycorrhiza and you don't get good mycorrhizal infection, which is crazy when you look at some of these products that are adding in trichoderma. Now, I've heard some people claim that trichoderma, their particular species of trichoderma does not inhibit mycorrhizal infection, which may be the case, but all the research that I've been able to find online done independently shows that it does, so I prefer to choose products. It's just easier for me to choose products that don't have uh, trichoderma in them. Now, a good friend of mine, Tim Wilson, actually speculates that a lot of the benefits that we're purporting attributing to mycorrhiza may actually be from the trichoderma that we're adding in these products because trichoderma is a lot more faster acting um, and it has a lot of plant benefits as well. But ideally, uh, mycorrhizal fungus would be added at initial transplant of a rooted clone or rooted seedling, and it's a one-time application directly to the roots. If it doesn't come in direct contact with the roots, it's gonna stay dormant for the life of the plant. So really important we get it in there early so it has a chance to infect, and we don't need to reapply it, because unless we're doing things to destroy that relationship, it should, it should exist for the life of the plant. And if we're reusing our soil, we should have active mycorrhizal spores or hyphae in there that will increase the rate of infection with our next with our next reuse of the soil. But just to compare some of these products, um, for example, this one down here, 2.46 propagules per gram of Interaces and Mossier, we would have to use uh, 10 times the amount of this product as we would of Mycos to get the same rates for, of spores per gram. Uh, this Myco maximum is 50 spores per gram. You pick up a little bit of humic acid and a little bit of sugar, but you're paying a heck of a lot more for it too. So most of the mycorrhiza is coming from uh, two to three sources in the entire United States, and a lot of it's coming from Premier up in uh, Canada. So a lot of what you're paying for is the packaging and marketing around these products. Now, I'm not here to pick on any particular company. I just picked random examples um, across the nutrient industry. So please don't take this as me saying any of these products are necessarily bad. I just think there's other options, um, and I just want to present some of those options for you today. Any questions about mycorrhiza before I move on to the next slide? No? Yes? What's the product name right here on the left-hand side? Oh, uh, yeah, it's hard to see. That's Mycos. It's made by RTI, um, M-Y-K-O-S. Molasses. So I see a lot of products like sweet and raw and strap, things, things relating to uh, unsulfured black strap molasses. Well, when you research the sugar industry, uh, molasses is just one of the steps in that, uh, in that process. And you can get unsulfured black strap molasses uh, very, very affordably. Like we're a feed store, any feed store should carry it. We sell ours for around $20 for a three and a half gallon bucket. Molasses is a great microbial food. I love to use it in compost teas. Um, it's got a lot of carbohydrates and sugars, and it's a heck of a lot cheaper, especially than uh, Bud Candy here, which runs almost $170 for the same amount. So there's no reason you can't source these things uh, other places where you're not paying you know, for a fancy label. Seaweed. Seaweed is probably my favorite soil amendment, uh, kelp meal. Uh, in terms of a soil amendment and seaweed extract powder in terms of a liquid seaweed product because uh, kelp meal is not, does not naturally solubilize in water. So if you want something you can water it or do a foliar application, that seaweed extract powder is great. Uh, seaweed contains over 70 different trace minerals. It's got plant growth hormones and regulators. So you hear things like cytokinins, oxygen, gibberellins on a lot of products. That's all coming from seaweed, primarily derived from seaweed if it's not being synthetically made. Uh, here's a bunch of different seaweed products. The type of seaweed that we want and the most widely researched is North Atlantic sea kelp. Uh, it's also known as Ascophyllum nidosum. And you want cold water extracted because it preserves the enzymatic qualities of the seaweed. And then they add um, they add something in to stabilize it afterwards. But so here's just a few different idea of all products derived. They're all seaweed products. And uh, for example, the one that we use we got cut off here is uh, Nature's Essence. Acadian is another brand of seaweed extract powder. 
you can buy two, you can buy a pound, which is approximately about two and a quarter, two and a, two and a half cups for under $20, and you're using a quarter teaspoon per gallon. So rather than paying for them to mix, slap a fancy label on it, pour a bunch of water, and you can make your own very, very affordably. And this, this product comes out of the agriculture industry. Uh, we source it out of uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and their primary accounts are all uh, farmers or tree, tree companies. They're not working with the cannabis industry. Uh, Hemic acids. I went to a trade show, uh, oh gosh, probably about seven or eight years ago, and I was talking with this guy and he was telling me that his product was from the dinosaur era and it was prehistoric. I had no idea he was talking about. About halfway through, I realized he was just referring to humic acids. So I've seen things called like fossil fuel and I don't know, dino magic, but they're all really just humic acid. And what humic acid is, is it is a mine product, typically from Leonardite or Lignite, and it's an excellent chelator. So that's just a fancy word for bonds with. The minerals in your soil it helps make the plant available. Uh, humus is what is the breakdown of organic matter over time to a stage where you can no longer tell if it was originally uh, peat moss or a dead carcass or any sort of original, we can't tell what the original uh, parent matter was under a microscope. And then a fraction of that is humic acids. Um, because it is so excellent at bonding with minerals, it's a great additive into your soil that you pick up naturally with humus but can add additional uh, with humic acids. And then a portion of humic acids, the smaller fraction of it, is fulvic acids. So humic acids bond with the mineral, and then this smaller fulvic uh, molecule allows for the direct uptake through the cellular walls of the plant of whatever it is it's chelated with. So the only true fulvic acid product that I'm aware of on the market is by BioEgg. It's called Full Power. But a lot of people will use that in with their uh, foliar applications as a way of increasing nutrient uptake. Uh, I threw a couple humic acid products up there. Uh, the first one, 6% by content. Uh, this Roots Organics one, 0.1% by content. Uh, we carry a, a powder, again from Organic Approach, but BioEgg makes these powders as well. Um, so not to pick on any particular company here. Uh, we sell ours for $12 a pound. It's 85% humic by content, and you're using just an eighth of a teaspoon per gallon. So one pound can make up 380 gallons. They also make one that's 90% humic acid by content, and another one is 100%. They're just more expensive. This one is the most affordable one that I'm aware of. So it's a great thing you can add into your nutrient regimen uh, without really increasing your costs. Oh, so BioEgg, yeah, B-I-O, capital A-G, is a company that makes a lot of these products. And then the one that we work with is called Terra Vita, T-E-R-A-V-I-T-A. Uh, Terra Vita, T-E-R-A-V-I-T-A. -E if you stop by our booth, I can show you the actual products. And, uh, oh, that's a good question. It's just right over here when you walk in. I don't remember. I should have. That's, I should know that. I know. Bad, bad marketing. All right, fish hydrolysate. So there's a big difference between fish hydrolysate and fish emulsion. Fish hydrolysate preserves the enzymatic qualities of the fish, and it's then stabilized with phosphoric acid, which is why it has that four there. Um, that's coming from the phosphoric acid. Uh, fish hydrolysate is one of the only strictly fungal foods out there that we found for microbes. So if you're making compost tea and you want to increase your fungal content, you can add a small amount at the very beginning of the brew. You don't want to add anything at the end of a compost tea brew. But I'll explain that later. It's got some nitrogen. I like to use it on our veggie starts at our farm if they just need a little boost as they're starting to get root bound in the little tiny four cylinder squares. Uh, and we also use it to charge our uh, biochar in our biochar soil. We soak it for a week in fish hydrolysate as a way of a way of filling all the cation exchange sites. And there's a ton of different brands out there. Uh, Organic Gem is a great brand. Neptune's Harvest. Uh, locally here, we have uh, eco nutrients and native nutrients. Um, one thing about fish emulsion is they typically use uh, trash fish, whereas fish hydrolysate uses a combination of different fishes and then uses the enzymes to break down further that, those fish carcasses. So it's a much better product. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention back here on the seaweed slide, 
we, in terms of seaweed, we want cold water process as well. Cold water process, ASCO found the dosa. Maxi crop, I believe, is heat or chemical extracted, which is why I don't typically recommend it, because that, again, destroys some of the enzymatic qualities of the seaweed. Biochar, how many people have heard of biochar? Wow, that's awesome. So we're fortunate enough to have one of the top biochar companies right here in Washington, up in uh, the Linden area. I think they're actually, I can't think, I can't think of the name of the exact city, but uh, Biochar Supreme, they make black owl biochar, is one of the top uh, biochar companies in terms of the research that they've done. Uh, we've been really fortunate to work with them with our soils and have them local. But it's based on a concept called Terra Preta, which uh, comes out of the Amazon basin and is a result of a breakdown of uh, clay pots and cooking that they were doing um, over the soils over a period of years and as that built up over time they end up with these really amazing rich soils uh, and we try to recreate that process by taking wood and pyrolyzing it which just means we're, we're cooking it at very very high temperatures with very very to low low to zero oxygen so it's different than charcoal in that regard and it has a much higher CEC, which is just stands for cation exchange capacity. It's essentially the ability of the soil to retain nutrients. The higher the CEC, the, better, the more nutrients that soil can hold on to, which in our case is a really, really good thing. Um, it also enhances soil fertility, mediates water conditions, increases soil carbon. A lot of their sales now are to larger companies that want to be more carbon neutral and uh, offset some of their um, carbon usage. It also is a wonderful habitat for microbes. And we have two soils that we make, one of which contains biochar. And my thought initially when we started making the soil, we use about 10% of our total media as biochar, which is quite high. Agriculturally, they're at one to 2% when they do applications. But I, I expected to see really good results on the second or third recycle of the soil. And it wasn't until I got this photo, which again is really hard to see, from uh, Gold Leaf Gardens, they're, a, a, they're now a 502 grow, but essentially, this was our biochar soil on the left, and this was our water-only soil on the right. Um, they were able to get about 8 to 10% better growth and yield by adding biochar, and then we saw that replicated uh, down the road by uh, other growers using, using both soils and doing experiments for me. So one thing I like to talk about in all my talks, because it's something that we're very knowledgeable about, is aerated compost teas. Uh, when we talk about these soils that are organic and we apply these fertilizers, we're not actually feeding the plant. And that's a really important distinction. We're feeding all these microbes that are in the soil that are then helping make these nutrients plant available. So as a way to increase this nutrient cycling process, which I'll talk about a little bit more, uh, aerated compost teas is a great way to do that. Uh, the important aspects of it is that we're getting oxygen in there at least uh, 0.05 to 0.08 CFM per gallon of water. Uh, we're adding high quality water that hasn't had, or sorry, does not have chlorine in it. You can remove the chlorine uh, prior to brewing. And then you're using a good compost source or earthworm castings, because that's going to contain the biology that we're starting with, that we're trying to extract. So we'll add a food source like molasses, or we have a product called microcatalyst that essentially just feeds those microbes to end up with a balanced tea of both bacteria and fungi. So, the idea behind compost tea is a shotgun approach. We're not trying to select for specific microbes. We're trying to get as many microbes as we can out there and really put the plant in charge in terms of what it wants around the roots. Uh, we've, seen, uh, we've actually seen some disease suppression abilities with, with compost tea, but the main benefit I like to really talk about is, is in regards to nutrient cycling, and I'll talk a little bit more about nutrient cycling here in a second. Uh, some of the claims I hear around compost tea that I just would like to dispel really quickly. Uh, brewing perpetually does not work well in terms of what you actually end up with. If we're making compost tea for diversity and say we brew this tea for longer than 36 hours, at 24 to 36 hours we've created this unsustainable amount of microbes. We can't maintain that. Um, from that time on as we get on to like three or four days or even a week, what you'll see is one species or one morphology of bacteria and one species or morphology of protozoa or flagellants and they'll just kind of go like this back and forth. So if you think about it, you open up all the gates in the zoo. At the end of the day, you'd have rats and lions and that'd be all that really would be left. So you, you don't 
have all that diversity over time. And then you'll find with the bacteria, well, the flagellates lead all the bacteria, you'll have way too many flagellates. And then there won't be enough food resources, so those will all die off, and then you'll just have a ton of explosion of bacteria, and it'll just go like that perpetually because uh, you lose that diversity. In addition, uh, you can't refrigerate compost tea effectively. If you think about it, you just created something that needs a heck of a lot of oxygen, and now you're taking away all that oxygen, you're, and you're putting it in the fridge and freezing it. So you're going to have organisms dying, you're going to have organisms going dormant. Um, it's not best practice when it comes to area compost teas. And lastly, I would just say that foam is not a good indicator of microbial uh, activity in compost teas. That's another myth that I've seen floating around. Uh, essentially, that's more typically rated to saponin content or from the earthworm castings or earthworm saliva that may have been in the original compost. Not necessarily, I've seen good teas with and without foam. Uh, here's a photo, I don't know if you can see, no, you really can't see it. It's a video, uh, the bacteria essentially are moving around. This is what a good area of compost tea looks like. Uh, right here you have fungal hyphae, uh, this is just a piece of organic matter, a piece of alfalfa. Uh, I've seen other compost teas, on, I've tried other microbial products when you buy like the put to sleep teas or instant compost teas. And uh, this is actually a video too, but you can't really see it, but there's really not much going on. Uh, you really can't evaluate compost tea without, uh, without a microscope. And when you see these microbial products that say they have a million of this type of bacteria and a million of that microbe, those can be very useful, but keep in mind that in just a teaspoon of living soil out of your garden, you're going to have over a billion bacteria and over 20 or 30,000 different species of bacteria. So when you put it in that perspective, those numbers really are not so staggering. So keep that in mind when you're looking at micro and evaluating microbial products. So. Sort of the consensus of my talk today is really around this concept that we like to call biological horticulture. Uh, you can't really Google it because we made it up, but I really like it because it captures a lot of the aspects of what we think are important when it comes to uh, gardening. Biological because we're focusing on the microbes that are in the soil. There's what they're what is cycling the nutrients and making the plant available. And then horticulture because we're pulling out of existing knowledge out of an industry that's already really established and has a lot of research and data to support the concepts that we're trying to promote. I love this photo because uh, it was when my friend Oceane came and visited from Australia, and she's a big hippie, and she had never seen trees this large, and it was just the look of awe on her face was great. Uh, and when you think about an ecosystem like this, this is some of the most diverse and successful ecosystems that we have in the world. And as Jeff Lowenfels likes to say, there's no one pouring miracle grow or any grow in blue formulas on these giant trees. They're growing because as they as they drop organic matter and as animals walk by and you know eat things and poop things out, that all breaks down and then the microbes in the soil are cycling back into, into uh, available forms and nutrients that the plant can uptake. So it's this sort of system that we're trying to recreate in an indoor environment by putting the plant in charge of its own habitat, its own ecosystem with the soil. So here's just a really easy chart to kind of show the way nutrient cycling works. Here we, uh, we have nutrients or nitrogen, however you want to look at it, that is then being uh, in ionic form that the plant can uptake. So the plant takes stuff in its leaf surface. When that plant dies, we're harvesting that plant. We're taking it out of the ecosystem and pulling it away from the soil. So that has to be replaced. So when we remove, when we harvest a plant, we're removing organic matter, we're removing nutrients. So those we have to replace every cycle if we want to reuse our soil. Putting them back in so the bacteria can break them down and, and cycle them back into a form that the plant can then uptake again. So one really cool uh, fact that I like to share is that Plants take 40% of the energy that they synthesize, photosynthesize, and put it back out through their roots in the form of exudates, in the form of sugars, carbons, and carbohydrates. This is important, it just, it just emphasizes how important this process is to a plant um, in terms of determining what sorts of nutrients a plant wants. So I stole this idea from Jeff because I love this example. Let's pretend that this is a plant root here. And this plant root decides that it wants more nitrogen or in this case, Japanese food. It will select by putting out the exudates that it wants to select for the bacteria that will provide it with the nitrogen in the form that it wants nitrogen. Same goes for phosphorus, 
or uh, know, Indian food, or you know, Mexican, you get the idea. So the plant controls this process, and it can actually change the X states it's putting out on an hourly basis. So by allowing the plant to have all the nutrients already in the soil and available to it, it's really able to dial in this process on a level much much better than we can as humans and guessing and waiting until we see a deficiency and saying, oh, this plant needs magnesium now, so now I'm feeding it magnesium. Well, we've already stressed out the plant at this point. If it was already in the soil, the plant can select for it as it needs it. Uh, every year we grow a giant pumpkin. This was my attempt my first year, uh, a few years back. I grew a, we grew a 725 pound pumpkin on just water by heavily amending the soils. Nowhere near the world record. The world record is over 2,300 pounds. So this is just a little baby. But the cool thing about giant pumpkin growers is they're on the cutting edge as well as cannabis in terms of the research and technology that they're using to grow these world records. So not only are they improving their genetics, but they topped out at about 1,200 pounds uh, back in around 2000 using strictly chemical fertilizers and they're really the ones that start pushing mycorrhizal fungus and start working back in towards the organic side and now all of them are using a hybrid method of both synthetics and organics in their growing in their growing methodology so i like to talk about just a, a few different sources of nitrogen um, all of these things are things that you'll find in a lot of bottled nutrients uh, fish meal is a great fast release high nitrogen source alfalfa meal is another great nitrogen source. It's also a great uh, fungal and bacterial food, and it contains a, a plant growth hormone called triacontinol, which is why you hear a lot of rose growers, they always add alfalfa, because it's one of those things that has um, triacontinol. Uh, neem cake is another one I really like, slow release nitrogen. It has a bunch of other compounds that may relate to uh, pesticidal properties. Uh, feather meal is a slow release nitrogen source. Uh, crab and crustacean meal is, uh, Another slow release, release nitrogen source, but it also contains chitin, something that insect frass, you may have heard of, is something that's high in chitin. Chitin releases an enzyme called chitinase, which can help with protecting plants from a lot of pests and predators. Uh, a bunch of different phosphorus sources out there. Potassium, most soils are high in potassium, so you don't typically need to add a lot of potassium. If you're using manures, or compost, or um, a lot of seaweed or seaweed extract powder, typically you'll pick up enough potassium. That being said, all the soil tests we've done on our soils have all come back very high potassium. And it seems that cannabis uses more potassium than a lot of other crops, or seems to appreciate it, which would fit with a lot of the P and K boosters that we see on the market as well. So I wouldn't freak out if your soil test comes back with a high potassium uh, amount. Here's an example of our soil test. This is the one we had to do on our uh, soils to get them registered as fertilizers, uh, looking at nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium there as a percentage. Now the numbers look quite low at 1% nitrogen of the, of the media, but when you think about that, when we buy fertilizer, let's say it's 10% nitrogen, we're then adding it to water and diluting it, and then we're adding it to a percentage of our media. So it's actually quite high in terms of the amount of nutrients that we're starting with in our soils. Uh, the type of test that I like to recommend for people to do is called a Malik 3 test. Logan Labs is probably my favorite company to work with on that. They run about $25 and it'll give you a really good idea of where you're starting from. So if you're setting up a greenhouse and you want to go directly into the soil, if you're building your own soil or you want to reuse your soil, that $25 is well worth it. Keep in mind that soil tests are just a guideline. They're not going to give you uh, exact ratios. Um, sometimes they're off and the tests will vary, but they're a wonderful way to get an idea of at least what your, you know, what your cabinet exchange capacity is, what your pH is at, um, what some of these nutrient levels are. And this is something that we've done with our soil now for about six years every cycle with some, some of our test growers so that we can start figuring out exactly what minerals and nutrients we want to have in there to balance out the biology that we're at. So some of the benefits of heavily amended or water-only soils, which is what I'm trying to promote people to uh, consider in their growing operations, they put the plant in charge of the growing, not you. Um, they allow for optimal plant health and growth. They require way less input and cost, and they reduce plant stress because the nutrients are already there that the plant can take up when they need to. 
Oh, and on that note, there are a ton of great recipes out there. Um, one of my favorites is from a gentleman named Clackamas Kid, or that's what he goes by online. And uh, he's put out some great information for people. If you search for his name, you'll see a ton of different mixes and recipes. Uh, that's a good starting mix for people who want to just try out mixing their own soils. I will warn you, mixing soils is a real pain in the ass. It's a lot of work, but uh, it can be really rewarding as well. Yes. Coot, C-O-O-T. Yes, I know. It's, a, it's his uh, username handle online. He was actually uh, instrumental for me when I first started looking into making soils. Uh, I had long conversations with him, and I took a lot of his concepts and then started doing uh, trials with the local horticulture college and experimenting recipes and doing the lab testing behind them to find out exactly what levels we had of different things. So, a lot of you guys are larger scale growers, and I want to talk, I could say that this process scales quite well. Uh, this photo here, which I realize is hard to see, is from Gold Leaf Gardens. They're uh, now a 500, or uh, they're now a 502 growing operation, but they were a medical grow operation, a 200 light medical grow in Seattle. They're using uh, these uh, scrog setups, and then all these soils, they're putting about a third of a yard on a pallet, and they can move these pallets around then. But, once that soil is in place, they're re-amending the soil directly in the bed and planting back into it uh, 24 to 48 hours later. So the amount of time that you have to spend with labor and moving soil around a facility, disposing of that soil, bringing in new media, is huge. This is a great way to save on that. And the next speaker, Jaya Palmer, is really going to talk more about a lot of the like bug strategies, um, how exactly the practical applications of this work. I just really want to give you guys sort of the science and theory behind why, why we practice this type of garden. Here's Jaya here. Uh, he's using an irimeter to measure the, the light output from the lights to make sure that the plant canopy is the right height at uh, Gold Leaf. And this was a photo from Gold Leaf uh, from one of their gardens. And they produce great quality great quality crops. They won the Dope Cup last year. Um, they command the top prices for their uh, for their cannabis in Seattle. And uh, right now, in the biochar soil, their last crop, they were around uh, 2.6 pounds per light, which is, which is awesome, um, using the biochar soil, and then they have a few little amendments and additives they like to add as well, but everything organic. Now, that being said, not all of our growers are organic that we work with. Um, like giant pumpkin growers, a lot of people like to use a combination of synthetics and organics. Uh, this video on the right, I took at Smoky Point Productions, and the photo on the left was shared with me from Green Rush. You can see they're much better photographers. Uh, and these guys are using synthetic nutrients in conjunction with organic soils. So even if you're growing chemically, you're going to see benefit from having all those microbes there in the soil initially and using a soil that is heavily amended. Uh, again, some more photos from Green Rush. Uh, these guys do a great job out there. And they're throwing away their soil and still deposing of, disposing of it like in a traditional way. But we're hoping to move more people towards reusing the soil uh, down the road. But the quality they're getting is quite high and really good. So just a few different things to recap that we've learned from um, this whole process in researching soils and, and talking about biological horticulture. Uh, there's no need to flush if you're using organic soils, which I know can be a sort of controversial issue, but let me explain my side of it. Uh, if you're growing in organics, you're not adding, there's no nutrients in ionic form that need to be removed from the soil. There's no excess of salts. All those nutrients are locked up within the cellular walls of the bacteria and archaea, the fungal hyphae, the flagellates, protozoa, ciliates. So when you flush, all you're flushing out at that point are potentially some microbes or any of the excess soluble nutrients, but not really removing anything of need in regards to flushing. So organic weed should not have to be flushed. Uh, you don't have to worry about pH. The plant is in control here, provided your water isn't dramatically off. You can water with regular tap water. Um, ideally, you can remove the chlorine, but you don't have to. We've run test gardens adding uh, water straight out of the tap, um, out of King County water, and the plants did great because uh, there's so much organic matter in the soil that uh, the chlorine gets complex quite quickly. And in terms of pH, well, the plant can really regulate that. There's research studies out there, which I'm happy to point people to, that show 
that a plant can adjust the pH right there in the rhizosphere, that's the area around the roots, up to two units, regardless of what the pH around the existing soil is, just by controlling its exudates and selecting for those microbial communities. So, if you're growing, trying to use organic soils and living soils in this method, you don't have to get so concerned about pH and nutrients, about pH in your water or your soil. The plant will take care of that for you. And we found that when our soil starts a little bit high, maybe slightly alkaline, or a little bit higher than we want, over time it will adjust down over six consecutive months to what we want it at, or what the plant wants it to be at. Um, so really it's controlling that process. Uh, we've also found there's a huge range for amending soils and adding nutrients. Uh, we have some growers, like I said, that add synthetic nutrients. We've experimented with adding you know, up to like five nutrient packs per yard of soil when re-amending to just a half a yard, a half a nutrient pack per yard of, a yard of soil when amending. So there's just a gigantic range that you can get away with there because, again, not all those nutrients are in a plant available form. Uh, that being said, less is always more. It's best to start with less and work your way up. So I always encourage people trying. Um, our soils or other water only soils to try a first crop literally with just water see what that does see if you're happy with it and then you can always expand on it down the road because I realize for a lot of people a lot of these claims sound very fantastical it's a lot to swallow first um, the other thing is it's best to keep the soil evenly moist if you have a moisture meter 80 to 120 m bar is ideal uh, there's a digital moisture meter made by uh, Blue Mats. I have one at the booth, I'm happy to show you guys. They run around $50, $60, and they allow you to really dial in your water. I'm convinced that we can, most people can improve their overall crop health and yield just by improving their watering. If you improve your watering, I think you can see anywhere from 5 to 15% 5 to increase in overall health and yield because you're not stressing out the plant. We want to keep the soil evenly moist because from a microbial perspective, that's really optimal in terms of overall microbial health. If the plant's stressed out from these wet, dry cycles, um, it's just not going to be as happy, and you're not going to you're not going to get as good of a yield. Um, in that regard, blue mats are awesome. Jai is going to talk about them more in his talk, and we have a few at the booth if you'd like to see them. But they're just a tiny tensiometer. It looks like a carrot with a ceramic tip, and they're not they don't use electricity, and they measure the soil tension in the soil, and then you can adjust them to drip out water, and you can do five drippers per carat, and they don't use any electricity. You can hook them up to a reservoir or to a uh, directly to a, a hose or water line, and they expand really well. You know, the people are, are using uh, you know up to 200, 300 plant systems with these, with these, and then it takes the water. I guess the amount of water because it takes care of the water for you once you have them dialed in. We've also actually found that the soil will improve over time, which makes a lot of sense. That's those are, the soil is being broken down by these microbes, uh, working its way towards humus. It's establishing soil structure as these microbial communities get going, the bacteria and, and fungi. Um, so the soil will actually, your second crop should be even better than your first crop. So a couple final thoughts I have for you guys. So even if you don't care about the fact you don't mind using toxic chemicals and mixing them yourselves and exposing you or your workers to these things. Or the fact that the over application of all these nutrients and disposal of all these potting soils is, is contributing to our dead zones, which are algal blooms caused by over application of phosphorus and nitrates that are contaminating our water supply and creating these areas where marine life can't survive. Or the fact that we're contaminating our drinking water. Um, in King County alone, back in the 90s, they found over 15 different types of pesticides in our, in our sampling of our creeks and streams. Um, so even if you don't care about any of that stuff, or the fact that the media is finally starting to get savvy about some of these uh, pesticides, this was from last Saturday, actually, uh, relating to uh, certain pesticides found in our pot, and there was a big issue with Guardian. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. It's a mite spray that was supposedly organic that they found, well, Avid, the main ingredient Avid in, and it was on the 502 list. So um, I think as we get further along in this industry, as it grows, the population, the, the culture is going to demand that we use the organics, that they are getting clean medicine and not any of this other crap. But if you didn't care about all that stuff, at the end of the day, it saves you money. Like, growing does not have to be prohibitively expensive. Yeah, it costs money to create these environments. It does cost money 
to get this stuff set up, but there's ways to cut down on these costs, and that's really what uh, I was here to talk about today. A couple resources I want to point out. Um, well, this is us, this is Kiss Organics. We have a lot of raw soil amendments for people. We do also make uh, water only and biochar soils. Um, Kiss Farm is our local farm in Redmond. That's just a, a site that talks a little more about that. If you ever are in the Redmond area, we'd love to have you guys stop by and take a look. We get baby chicks in uh, tomorrow, our first batch, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, Teeming with Microbes is one of my two favorite books. It talks a lot about the microbial process, soil food web. Jeff is a wonderful author and a good friend of ours, and the soil tests in that book are, are actually, or the compost tests are from uh, our company. The other book I really like is called The Intelligent Gardener by Steve Solomon. So he focuses more on the mineral aspect of things. So what he did was he took the premise that uh, if the minerals are not in our soil, then they're not in our crop. And if they're not in our crop, well then we're not getting the proper vitamins and nutrition and minerals that we need in our stuff. So uh, basically he, he, was, he founded Territorial Seed and Gardening uh, west of the Cascades and was eating off of his land homesteading essentially. 80% of his food was coming in the form of vegetables off of his land and his gums were getting loose, his teeth started falling out, his wife's fingernails were getting soft and he moved to Tasmania and his health started improving dramatically and so he looked at where they were sourcing the vegetables and it was this uh, valley that would flood every year from an igneous rock deposit, an old volcano. The valley would flood essentially remineralizing the soil. So that got him looking into a lot of the works by Albrecht and Reeves and Michael Astaire, all these people that were focused on minerals, and uh, prompted him to write this book. So essentially the concept is get a soil test in your garden, or in this case your, your soil mix, find out what nutrients are present and what are, are missing, and then amend for optimal nutrient density so we're growing a healthier crop. Um, these two are very opposite concepts, and unfortunately the two kind of butt heads. So Dr. Lane Ingham says, Soil tests don't me accurately measure what minerals are in the soil. Microbes will make all these minerals present. You don't need to add minerals. These guys say, uh, Estera and, and Solomon say, you need to add the minerals to the soil. They'll make the biology appear, break it all down, and that's what gives you optimal soil health. We like to do both. So we take that soil testing, we add the minerals, we add the biology. It seems to be the best of both worlds. Um, it's working great for us on the farm. It's worked great for us with our soils. And uh, these two books would give you a good theory behind that. The last thing I want to mention is logicalgardener.org. It's a forum that I started with a friend of mine, Tim Wilson. It's a free forum. It's just science-based horticulture. And uh, it's not cannabis focused, though there is a cannabis section. But if you want to get good information relating to all the stuff that I talked about today, that's a great place to go. It's free, no advertising. And uh, thanks again for listening to my talk. If there's any questions, I'm happy to stick around and answer them. If you're anxious to jet off to another uh, another exhibit or something, I understand too. Yes? So you're talking about soil time and breakdown. I, I cannot hear you at all, sorry. You're talking about soil improving and breakdown over time. About improving soil? Yeah, so you're talking about soil breaking down and turning into hummus. Yeah. And, you know, we know that cannabis is the very plant that soil continues to microbes to break down. Yes. How long until you have to, by general means, add and reinstitute your organic material that you're talking about, mixing in actual amendments and stuff that you're recycling? Good question. Okay, so essentially the question was, cannabis is a plant that consumes a lot of nutrients, so how are you uh, accounting for that as these nutrients are breaking down, when are you re-amending the soil? So what we found, uh, the best process is, is when we go to harvest the plant, we literally yank the plant out, whatever roots come out of the plant are great, we'll shake off whatever soil is, is left on there and take the plant out for uh, harvesting. We'll then add a small amount of nutrients and a small amount of organic matter in the form of compost. We use only not fish compost, it's when we test it, but you can use any good compost source like Malibu compost is another great one, uh, worm casting is another great source. Uh, per yard we're adding about a cubic foot of compost back in and then half to one of our nutrient packs, which is a combination of a, a variety of organic uh, minerals and nutrients or whatever soil amendments you choose to use in your soil. Uh, you mix those back in. 
we wait 24 hours and then we bring in our next crop into our flowering room. So that's that's how we do it and we found it works well for us. We don't necessarily, it's not strictly no-till, but we're not really going to disturb the soil beyond the phylosphere, which is the first few inches of the soil. So, um, and that area is designed to be disturbed naturally by nature. Does that answer your question? Uh, right behind you was actually from, yeah. Sorry, to build on that. Yeah. Do, are you talking about like a, like a fast, like next cycle run? You don't have to wait, or like, are you doing anything to treat the green grid? So when you, we first mix the soil, we're putting a lot more nutrients in, about 100 pounds per um, per yard of soil. When we go to re-amend the soil, we're adding a lot less, you know, nine to ten pounds of nutrients. So we're able to. We, the, there's not enough organic nutrients in there for the soil to heat up and cool down for the bacteria to bloom. So we're able to re-amend and use the soil again right away. So there's no downtime. Yeah, because I know a lot of people traditionally would take that soil, remix it have to wait weeks again before you can use it again and then you have that downtime. So what we tried to do is cut that down to where you can literally plant, you know, a day or, or a couple of days later. Yeah. So then when you oh, sorry, I'll get you next. So when you're done with that, let's see, you're done with the problem. Yeah. So is that when you would send out a sample to the bailing for slug testing to know what you're amending that again? Yes. So I realize that doesn't leave a gap time before you're re-amending. So what we'll typically do is we'll take a sample then and send it in and see where our test results. We'll re-amend and keep things going. But uh, you could at that point add more in down the road before um, you know, lightly, by lightly top dressing with amendments or for that next cycle plan ahead and then make adjustments on that next you know, three month cycle. You're right, sorry. So in the lightly top dressing, That's a good question. There's a great article that I can that online that I can send to you. It's called the I think it's called the Fundamentals. Of um, I'll have to look it up. But there's a bunch of different compounds in meat that are really beneficial beyond just aspiractin, um, which is the one you hear about the most. So the way I like to use neem cake is for fungus gnats primarily. Um, two cups of neem cake in a five-gallon bucket. You can also use karanja cake. Uh, let it bubble or, or stir it for 48 hours so it's fully solubilized. Water the surface of the plant or the soil and it'll kill off all your uh, fungus now. It's a great way to treat it for a few dollars. You know, you still have to catch the adults that are going to be laying eggs, so it takes a couple applications. But I've treated rooms that were out of control with fungus gnats with this and had, you know, under 10 bucks. So. And how can we get a hold of you? Oh. Uh, either of those websites will be to us, or I can do the card after the talk, or we have a booth right over there. Thank you. Yes. Uh, let's go right here. Yeah. So, between you guys' sites, you guys In terms of enzymes, uh, there's a great enzyme product out there that you can make yourself with barley. Uh, it's, a lot of people are calling it sprouted CT, CT but essentially, uh, a lot of these enzyme products are coming essentially from this process. So you can take uh, whole grain mal malted barley, blend it up, add it to water, and water your plants, and you'll get huge uh, enzyme enzyme for growth. Because they're all in the seed. What? They were doing that, and then they figured out uh, a lot of growers figured out that you don't even have to sprout it. If you buy the malted barley whole, you can actually just grind that up. But it needs to be whole. But the malting raises it to the highest enzymatic levels for brewing and then arrests it. So then you just take that and, and grind it up. Yeah, so you can look that up online. Um, there's a bunch of places or forums that are talking about that. But that's a great way to get really good enzymes. And that's something you can apply at the end. You do have to be careful with young plants. It's a little too much. But if you think about it, a lot of the enzymes that plants need are coming out of that seed. Everything a plant needs initially to grow is, out of, is in the seed itself. So what you're doing is you're just taking that and they'll add it to like uh, coconut water or aloe, and then that's sort of the cheap concoction for an enzyme tea. Yeah. You could, yeah, or you could add aerated compost tea to get more of those decomposing microbes back in there. But um, if you pull that out, you know the roots that are what remaining roots are in there, just the small root hairs, are going to contain some 
uh, mycorrhizal hyphae and spores already, and it breaks down pretty quickly. I haven't noticed any issues with just reusing it right away. They, they seem to disappear pretty quickly in the soil. If you, you know, start with a good compost and have good microbial activity. So when we when we reamend the soil, just you guys can hear. Um, he's asking if we do any like topical application or harrowing or hoeing essentially in the soil. Yeah. So what we're doing is we'll take our nutrients and our organic matter and maybe a little bit of perlite to keep the aeration because we can't just keep adding compost. We'll eventually get too uh, too soggy. So we'll take that and just dig it in lightly into the first few inches. Yeah. Ideally, these blue mats are awesome. They're a drip system that we can show you at the booth. Um, there's a couple other places. Seattle Hydro Spot has a demo that's probably a little better than ours um, than their booth. But Seattle's Hydro Spot, they have a booth here too, so you can stop by either one of us um, understand blue mats. Uh, they're just something that we found we really like, but in terms of watering, we want to water slowly. It's, it's called the pulse watering technique, but essentially just means it's like water like five plants at a time. So you'll you know, a little bit here, go on down, and then come back to that first one. But we've had guys that have gone years without any runoff. So our, our goal here is not to waste water as well. And we don't want to leach nutrients out of the soil. So provided that you're watering appropriately and keeping the soil even moist, um, that's the best way to water. Yes, yes very close to the field capacity. In fact, I just posted a video on our Instagram. If you're on Instagram, I don't know a lot back. And squeezing the soil and then showing. So essentially, you can almost squeeze a drop out of it. Um, and it, it clumps, but then kind of falls apart. It's sort of the, the layman's version of uh, field capacity and what we're aiming for in terms of moisture content. Yeah. Any other? Uh, yes. Do we have a soil test? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, in terms of an optimal levels for a soil test, it's not something that's been completely dialed in for cannabis. Um, our soil tests, when we test our soils, don't exactly match what Steve Solomon recommends, for example. Though I do know people growing cannabis using his thing, which is, so there is a range. I can send you a copy of our soil test, which we're happy to share that in terms of what levels we're getting. Sure, yeah. Yeah, that's not a problem. But keep in mind, soil test is just a loose guideline. It doesn't exactly um, tell you exactly what's in your soil. So don't freak out if he thinks you Yeah. Yes. I have a great article I can, if you send me an email, I can send you from, yeah. I can't remember the exact percentages uh, off the top of my head. We use about a gallon and a quarter in ours to a gallon and a half. 24 to 36 hours is the general time frame. Yeah. And then you want to use it, because again, you've created this unsustainable amount of microbes without one. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Personally, I don't, but that's just because I'm lazy. Um, it's not because I don't think it has a benefit. When we go out to a job site, um, like as a landscape or something, for some of these high-end landscapes on Mercer Island, we'll just spring everything. So we'll douse uh, foliar in the ground and just hit everything. So the idea behind a foliar application is that we're occupying infection sites on the root surface, thereby reducing the amount of disease pressures that are able to make get a foothold on the plant. The research out there behind that is sort of hit or miss. Some of the tests they don't work, but then they're not using uh, good controls. So. It's not what I like to promote when I think of compost tea, it's more the nutrient cycle. Yes, Jay. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, because of the testing that they do, I wouldn't recommend spraying it on cannabis during flower. Yeah, or during, during wood. Yeah, in a conventional garden, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't make that clear, but good point. All right, are there any other questions? All right, hey, I really appreciate you guys coming out today. Thank you so much.